Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Richard Marsh, and I'm a partner in BDB Pittman's planning and infrastructure team. Uh, this morning's business breakfast uh, will cover issues around private investments in UK infrastructure. Uh, and we are very fortunate to be joined by Lawrence Slade, uh, CEO of Global Infrastructure Investor Association, so the GIIA, which is a bit more manageable, uh, and also John Kavanagh, who's Head of Policy and Public Affairs at the GIIA. Um, so we'll just wait for um, attendee numbers to level off. Um, so we'll just wait, wait one minute. So if you want to restock your coffee. Uh, obviously, normally you'd have a, a B2B Pittman's uh, uh, bacon butty. But we might have to wait a few months for, for those to return. Yeah, I've been missing those. <laughs> Okay, so numbers appear to be stable and leveling off now. Um, so welcome again to, to this B2B, B2B Pittman's Business Breakfast. Um, and as I said, we're joined by Lawrence Slade, CEO uh, of the Global Infrastructure Investor Association, uh, and John Kavanagh, who's Head of Policy and Public Affairs at the GIIA. Um, so Lawrence has been in, in his position as uh, CEO uh, for just over a, a year now. Um, I'll leave Lawrence to give you a bit more uh, information about the GIA's work, um, but in short, it's a, the membership body for the world's leading infrastructure investors and advisors to the sector. Uh, before before jo joining the GIA, Lawrence was CEO of uh, Energy UK, as many of you will know, um, and in indeed has been involved in the energy industry uh, for many years, uh, since the late 90s, uh, and has uh, globe been globe trotting uh, all over the world to places like Siberia and beyond. Um, so today, Lawrence um, and John will be discussing um, opportunities and challenges around private investment in UK infrastructure. Um, I'm sure there'll be some talking points too coming out of uh, the budget, was, which was obviously this time last week, uh, and then also what the next steps are for uh, infrastructure investment uh, in the UK. I'm, I'm sure that will touch upon um, uh, Brexit. And, and maybe even post COVID considerations. Um, so ahead of last week's budget, the GIA published their seven steps for gov the government to get, get private investment in infrastructure moving. And they were drawn from uh, their, their policy document, the future of UK infrastructure. There were then several infrastructure related announcements in the budget, including new port infrastructure for offshore wind, uh, locations of free ports, further details of the UK infrastructure bank, which would be particularly relevant today, and then also other measures to level up the UK um, uh, in economy terms and also in relation to the transition to net zero, although far fewer references to net, net zero than during last year's budget. Uh, and then in addition, the Treasury published their Build Back Better document, which is very Boris-like, um, and set out the government's plans to support economic growth through investment in infrastructure, skills and innovation. So as we are hopefully exiting the coronavirus pandemic, uh, exiting the largest economic contraction in 300 years, and as we have exited the European Union, uh, the question is, is the government doing enough to facilitate global investment in UK uh, infrastructure uh, to ensure uh, a Keynesian infrastructure focused recovery? Uh, this morning, there'll be 20 minutes or, or so of talking um, from Lawrence and John. And then the remainder will be a Q&A. So please do submit any questions you have uh, via the Q&A uh, function, Zoom function. Um, and you have the option to, to ask, ask your question uh, anonymously. Um, and then if you have any technical issues, uh, please use the chat box. Uh, and my colleague, Melissa, will, um, will aim to help you. Um, so it's now over to Lawrence and John.
Thank you uh, very much, Richard, and thank you to uh, BDP Pittman's uh, for, for the invitation to uh, chat to everyone this morning. Um, it's interesting, I was just doing some, some research, and uh, I think the last time I spoke to uh, or, or attended a business breakfast with you guys was, uh, was back in 2015. Um, and it's certainly missing the, uh, the bacon butties and such like this morning. But I wonder actually whether by the time we get to the end of uh, this morning's session, whether we'll be talking about, uh, unfortunately talking about some, some similar things that we're, we're waiting for um, as we were back in 2015, although things may be moved on a, a little bit. So I've got some slides this morning that as Richard says, I hope to um, rattle through um, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then really look forward to, uh, to some Q&A later. So um, the first couple of slides are, are all about GIA. And John, if we could have the next slide, please. I really like showing this slide uh, for context uh, at meetings like this, particularly when people may not be familiar with, with who we are. Um, but I think basically we've got around about 80 members now, 60 of those are active investors in, in global infrastructure and they range from sovereign wealth funds to uh, more sort of familiar names like uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, in terms of uh, the funds themselves, but also individual pension funds, large and small and completely around the world, stretching from Japan, India, uh, California, Canada, Europe, and the UK. So I think it's fair to say a, a cross-section of companies that uh, are investing globally in infrastructure, but has to be said with a, a significant um, exposure to, to the UK infrastructure market. John, next slide, please. I think, as I say, it is a, a, a global uh, investment. And as we say here, it's investments in, in over 1,700 uh, different assets around the world. Um, many of those are in the UK. We're looking at somewhere in the region of, uh, in terms of value, that's around about a trillion dollars of assets under active management uh, by the management right now. And you can see from, from the, uh, the pie chart here, there's a significant concentration in Europe and a big chunk of that, as I say, is in the UK itself. But uh, other core markets, as you can see from here, whether that's North America or Australia, etc. I think the, the interesting thing here is, sorry, John, can you go back a slide? The interesting thing is that we're also spread right across assets. So whether it's renewables, social infrastructure, telecoms, transport, etc., um, there are members invested in it. And although none of us actually commuted to this meeting this morning, necessarily, um, we are using infrastructure that is almost certainly owned by some GIA members, whether that's the energy you're using, the electricity, the gas, whether it's the water you're, you've used to make your coffee this morning, or indeed whether it's the digital infrastructure um, that uh, fingers crossed will keep us going uh, throughout this, this webinar. Okay, John, next slide. One of the things that, that struck me uh, as we move into the sort of the business part of, of the slides, um, when I joined GIA a little over a year ago, as Richard said, was the infrastructure gap. And that's the fact that around the world, um, we are frankly not spending enough on renewing, reshaping our infrastructure. And the really important thing to my mind about this slide is we weren't spending enough on our infrastructure before we all committed to delivering uh, net zero emissions by 2050. So in other words, take this $15 uh, figure and, and add quite substantially to it. I think that you can also say that a big chunk of that figure, um, according to the ASCE in the US, at least $5 trillion of that um, has a home in the USA but also significant chunks have a home in the UK, if you look at the McKinsey report on this matter, uh, but also over in, the, in Europe, you're looking again at, at a figure in the, the many, many billions of, uh, of euros short. And that, of course, is again spread over, if we think of that last um, pie chart, it's spread over the whole economy. So infrastructure isn't just energy, it isn't just transport, it isn't just telecoms, it's right the way across the scene. And as we do head into a net zero world, then you're going to start seeing more and more 
these different infrastructure areas coming together as digital becomes a red thread that actually connects everything together in terms of how we manage our infrastructure, how we manage our assets. Next slide, please, John. One of the things that, that I think is, is always interesting, and perhaps there's, there's no real surprises here in terms of um, the sort of public uh, attitude towards infrastructure, but I think, again, it's, it's this point that um, respondents always strongly believe that investment in infrastructure delivers a positive economic activity. And yeah, I, I'm obviously a firm believer in that myself, but one of the things that I think we, we always, uh, we always struggle to do is to bring the public with us, to bring stakeholders with us when we're talking about infrastructure projects. We always default to talking about the value, the, the, the cost of infrastructure. So when we talk about a project, we talk about the X billion dollar project or the X billion pound project. What we don't do is talk about the value that that project is going to bring to local communities in whether it's jobs or ease of transport or uh, bringing broadband to rural communities and how that can revolutionize how we work, how we operate. So there is this big issue that we have that although the public generally supports infrastructure, we've got to look at how we address that and how we communicate and how we bring people with them. And again, I think with net zero, that's a really critical aspect that we have to, we have to deal with. Next slide, please, John. So this is the infrastructure pulse survey that uh, we publish in partnership with uh, Alvarez and Marcel, the, the global consultants in, the, in this arena. And again, I think that the, the sort of key thing from this morning's perspective uh, on this slide that I wanted everyone to, to look at is um, the UK and Ireland numbers where you can see that the sort of basically the investment community who responded to, to our survey here um, you really don't feel that the, the UK and Ireland are, are matching up as much or as well as some of the other areas around Europe in terms of the attractiveness um, of investing in, in the UK and Ireland. And I think there's a, there's a bit of a, a, a double whammy here in, in many respects over the last few years. And firstly, the, the sort of there's been issues over privatisation, um, in particularly the, the stance um, up until the, the recent election. And of course, it's, it is still in, in on the books as far as the Labour Party is concerned. But then there's also the the issues around regulatory pressures that we've seen uh, with the all the discussions ongoing with settlements in water and, and the ongoing discussions in in energy. And I think that's created this sort of nervousness, if you will, uh, amongst investors that we can see the opportunities in the longer term, but there's this lump of uncertainty that sits around us right now. And no doubt we're, you know, I'll pick this up a bit later and it will undoubtedly come up in questions, but I do feel that there was probably a bit of a missed opportunity by the government around the, the budget to start um, putting that right. John, next, next slide, please. So um, we published with, uh, with one of our member companies, uh, PwC, an unlocking capital for, for next zero infrastructure report. And this was really a sort of a way of, if you like, updating um, that $15 trillion number um, that I showed you earlier. And it's, it's really quite stark that over the next 10 years, um, we need to be spending around 40 billion pounds per annum. So round it up 400 billion um, in the next decade. And that's just in the UK. And that's just in the 30s. You can add that for the 40s and you can add that for the 50s. Um, and it is bluntly a doubling of our current investment levels and it is across all parts of the economy so it is transport power buildings and industry and you know if I put some of my other hats on or reflect on on the last decade we know we're already not spending enough on the infrastructure of our buildings for example so we know we're not doing that we know we're going to have to spend much, much more in terms of EV infrastructure if we're going to hit the government's marks in terms of moving to, to electric transport. So, you know, big, big questions. And then you get the third bullet, 
where more than half of that investment requirement, there isn't actually a firm policy framework that provides the investors with that confidence that yeah, how to remove that big lump like I mentioned just then. And, and that creates this, this problem um, around the investment and the risk and increases the cost of finance. And, and that's what causes that hesitation. And in some cases, indeed, could make it prohibited. Uh, but that, that's more referring to some of these more nascent technologies like CCUS and like, for example, uh, small modular reactors, SMRs on the, on the nuclear side. Um, next slide, please, John. So just quickly, some of the things that uh, we've been up to um, in, in the UK um, as a trade association, as I say, the members have got north of $300 billion uh, or pounds invested in the UK. So it's a substantial uh, area of interest for us. And I think, yeah, there, there has been some, some, some positive moves movement in terms of, of the government publishing um, information and, and giving us a yeah I think we've got to the point where we can we can see a vision now in terms of where we want to go so whether that's the uh, the PM's 10-point plan or the national infrastructure strategy the establishment of the office for investment with Lord Grimstone uh, involved in that the investment minister the long-awaited energy white paper um, but then there's there's lots more that's happening now all around us. So I mentioned the regulatory price determinations earlier. We've then got the regulation policy paper that the Treasury are leading on. We've got the establishment of the National Infrastructure Bank, which I'm sure will come up in, in questions. Likewise, the NSIB, the National Security and Investment Bill. And then these additional strategies, the transport decarbonisation plan, the EV charging strategy, the hydrogen strategy, the digital strategy. There's lots of strategies. What we're actually needing is probably uh, a, a delivery plan would be helpful uh, for this. And I think it's, it's really interesting um, that the National Infrastructure Commission published last week uh, their 2021 monitor report a week before. And in their 10 points or, or their 10 asks in there, um, it was interesting that, that that was exactly what they were calling for. We need a delivery plan and we can come back to that in the q and I'm sure. Next slide, please, John. So some quick reactions to, to the budget and obviously happy to, to drill down more uh, in the Q&A uh, with these. So I think the, the first bullet here, um, I'd probably, add the word cautiously welcome uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, why do I say that? Um, yeah, we, we've, we've said this in public in the FT. Um, it's, it's how the mandate of the bank is set up. We've seen and indeed we've, we've had lengthy conversations with Treasury about this. We've seen examples elsewhere um, around um, infrastructure banks that have been set up that have crowded out private capital which is great for the infrastructure bank because it shows good performance. But actually what we need is an infrastructure bank that crowds in private finance, that helps de-risk projects, that helps bring that confidence into the market. Because in a time like we are today, where actually the public purse is under significant pressure, we want to be able to unlock the hundreds of billions of private capital that investors have so we can get our pound working harder so we can get more projects underway so you want it crowding in and actually you want it taking a few risks to get these nascent technologies actually underway so really critical element there that we'll be uh, working with government and stakeholders hard on but i think it's another good sign that the government flags that it's going to be targeted at green infrastructure projects with that's entirely correct and obviously you've got the pressure that cop 20 26 is bringing to bear in, in that regard. Likewise, and Richard mentioned this at the start, the investment in ports infrastructure, yeah, big tick for that. I think it's, it's exactly what, what needs to be happening. But that last bullet point, again, uh, it is that missed opportunity. And I haven't mentioned this earlier, but we estimate um, our members alone have somewhere in the region of $200 billion of dry powder. So that's funds that have been raised that are not yet committed um, to, uh, to infrastructure assets. So there's a, there's a big fund there uh, ready and waiting. Uh, next slide, John. 
So Richard mentioned these, these earlier, and I'll, I'll just quickly rattle through these because I know we want to get on onto the Q&A. So the first point there is to make sure that actually we, we've got a local infrastructure hub, we've got a local transport operations that can work. I think that's really critical to, to the government's levelling up agenda and coming out of COVID, we need to make sure that that infrastructure is there to support our operations. The second point here, um, I'm gonna skip because my final slide talks about that in more detail. Uh, the third point is that clear net zero delivery plan. Kind of speaks for itself, but investors need that visible long-term project pipeline. Number four, it's provide that development capital. And that's where it links in with, with number five around the, na the, the National Infrastructure Bank. It's getting that, those nascent markets up and running. Six, we all understand the reasoning behind the National Security and Investment Bill, but we've got to make sure, you know, it sounds a bit sort of, uh, but we've got to make sure it offers a user-friendly experience. In other words, it's got to have a smooth, transparent decision-making ability. What we don't want is to go and be summoned and say, we're going to call your, your investment in and still be waiting for a decision a year later. It's got to be something that happens in weeks and months. And then last but not least, and there's always a lot of talk around PFI and, and PPPs, etc., public-private uh, partnerships, but actually there's an awful lot we can learn from, from lessons around the world in this regard. And I think, you know, we can look at CFDs, we can look at regulated asset base as funding models, but actually let's be imaginative and let's see how we can work together and where we can learn lessons from Australia, from Canada, from Saudi, et cetera, as to the, how these things can work and make sure that we're delivering the best for, for the UK. Next slide, John. So, yeah, there's, there's, I said I'd spend a little bit more time on, on regulation because so much of our inf infrastructure sits within in some form of regulation and that could attract more, there could be more coming into this over time. And I think from when we started privatising a lot of our, our infrastructure sectors to today, we haven't necessarily updated or been clear around the roles and responsibilities between government and regulators and how those work and and indeed if you think of Ofgem uh, if you go back to the mid middle of last decade uh, DEC as was then tried to draft some strategic guidance for Ofgem but it never actually got issued so Ofgem have never had that that guidance from from government I think off what had one a few years ago but we need this reshaping we need to update the duties of the sectorial regulator to reflect those future challenges and to reflect the the costs and the investment we need to make in our infrastructure and that's are all around the third point is how we strive for that intergenerational equity in the cost of our infrastructure and what do we mean by that that we don't backload on future generations the cost of hitting net zero for example that we spread that cost over the next few decades, but also that we spread that cost fairly across society. And that is a really difficult thing to, for, to do. We need to though incentivize innovation over the long term, give us that sight, give us that certainty, companies will buy into that. Ensure that the regulatory re appeals re regime re remains robust. We want to make sure that there is a, a fair a way of delivering appeals and to not water that ability down. Again, that's part of the gold standard regulatory regime that the UK has been uh, known for that feels a little bit weaker from an investor point of view right now. And then I think lastly, work to ensure that the frameworks for investment are consistent across the economy. Why is there such a difference in approach between different sectors? Let's make sure that we get this, this sense of consistency across the economy. And final slide, John. So that's that's me in terms of the the, the staged presentation, if you like. Um, I hope, Richard, I, I took up my fifteen to twenty minutes uh, on on time. I think there, um, but now very happy to uh, to switch to uh, to Q and A and uh, to to work my way through through your questions as much as I can. Thanks, Lawrence. That was uh, excellent. Um, first. 
question um, is around uh, pipeline of projects. So in terms of stimulating investment, how important is it for government to set out clear long-term pipeline of investable projects so that investors have clarity on what is coming down the track uh, and so they can align their long-term decision-making accordingly? Um, I mean, I, I think the answer to that, Richard, is, is it's absolutely critical. Um, and we haven't really had that long-term pipeline for, for a while. And I think you know, if it's well worth digging out the, the National Infrastructure Commission monitor report, I mean, it's 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 there writ large uh, from them that we need that. And I think, you know, one of the things I, I didn't say was, that, of course, we are in an international market in terms of attracting this this funding. And yeah, if we want to win that competition, it's incumbent on us to have that long term, not just the vision, but to have that delivery plan that clearly says, look, this is what we need to do to achieve net zero across the economy. These are the sectors that uh, government is going to look after or projects that government specifically is going to look after. This is where we want to work with private investors to deliver infrastructure in this area. So it's got to be top of the government's list now, getting that delivery plan up and running. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, another question. If in the in the sort of context of where we are in terms of COVID, um, is there is there a danger that um, uh, investment will flow towards the likes of uh, energy um, uh, uh, networks, and maybe not so much towards um, sort of built environment and transport because of what's happened, or or do you think that that's that's merely a, a short term uh, fear? Uh, I think that that's, that's... I mean, the, the logic, there's a logic in that question, I think, in, in terms of um, when you think of, of decarbonisation and next zero, I think everything that, or to a certain extent, everything that's been achieved to date has been in, in the energy sector. And I think we've made absolutely fantastic strides in, in the last few years with offshore wind and, and the wind farm in, my, in the background with me here and solar, et cetera. So there is this sort of temptation, I think, to think of net zero as being an energy play. But actually, if you look at the, the way the CCC presents it, for example, um, it is a whole economy issue. And from a government point of view, you can't just direct uh, investment to, to energy. You've got to make sure that the story, that the value, et cetera, is there to decarbonize transport. And you've got to separate out how you're going to do that with heavy transport, with the train networks, with B2B transport. I mean, it's great to see yeah. companies like Centrica, for example, committing to not buying another internal combustion engine. I think they ordered 2000 more electric vans the other day. That's one, one part of it, but actually we've got to decarbonize ourselves. So we've got to make sure the incentives are in place and the infrastructure is in place to see consumers starting to, to adopt faster on EVs. So I think it's, it's incumbent on the government and on us to make sure that it, it doesn't just go into one sector and that we see investment in, in low carbon and zero carbon activities right the way across the, the economy. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, right, Someone, someone's pressed the, uh, the nuclear button. How do you see institutional investors responding to gigawatt scale nuclear projects uh, in the UK? And you, you mentioned uh, SMRs uh, uh, a few moments ago as well. So. So I think there's there's a there's a couple of important things there. Um, I mean, I think obviously government sees nuclear as as part of the the zero carbon energy mix um, going forward. Personally, and it is a personal view, um, I would concur with that. I think we've achieved an awful lot, um, but I think government needs to to work with the investor community, for example, to really make sure that we can satisfy the ESG the agenda in particular to make sure that we're we're answering the environmental questions to make sure that we're working with local communities and we're delivering the long-term uh, benefits there so to make sure all of all of those elements are there i think there's a there's a need for government to make sure it has skin in the game in this respect as well maybe that's another role for the national infrastructure bank but I think there's also an opportunity for us to, to look at some of the, as I said, the sort of emerging technologies here to see if we can bring those forward too. So I think there, there is a role, but there are definitely questions that need to be answered. But 
in, a, in so much of this, Richard, it will require everyone getting around the table and having sensible discussions around what can be achieved. Moving nicely on to um, the, uh, the infrastructure bank. Um, uh, Rishi obviously said it was the first uh, infrastructure bank, but I'm, I'm not sure that's quite the, quite the case. Um, so what, 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 it, what is your view on the success of the Green Investment Bank um, in crowding, um, in funding, and do you expect the, the NIB to follow the same or a different approach? Well, I mean, uh, so the, the Green Investment Bank has, has just ticked off, um, I saw a few weeks ago, a month ago, um, its objective that it was set by the government uh, in terms of the amount it's investing in, in green uh, funds. So arguably that you could say that that's, that's obviously working. Um, I think in terms of National Infrastructure Bank, so the government committed to, I believe, 12 billion um, of initial funding um, to support 40 billion of green projects um, over the next period. That to me gave, and I said this in my slides, a, a, a level of cautious optimism in terms of how that works. If I'm correctly interpreting it along the lines of you know, you're investing 10 of government money to get 30 of private investment, that seems the right way round. I think it's gonna be really important the projects that uh, the bank decides to support and, and how that moves it forward. It's interesting if you look at the Canadian Infrastructure Bank uh, as an example, where the Canadian government, I believe, have actually mandated the bank to lose a certain amount of money every year, i.e. for it to get involved with, with projects at the riskier end that perhaps aren't going to attract um, long-term patient finance from um, pension funds, etc. So actually get involved in that market. Some you're going to win, some you're going to lose. I think that that's a very good approach. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, question about social infrastructure. Um, uh, Lawrence, please remind us what you, what you include under social infrastructure investments, which was on um, uh, one of the earlier slides, I think. So social infrastructure, um, I'll be honest, it's one of my weaker areas, uh, but social infrastructure tends to be the schools and hospitals, um, that side of that side of things. Okay. Uh, okay, question from my colleague, Tom Henderson. Um, periodically, periodically um, you can guarantee that there will be some sort of review into whether the UK planning system uh, is disincentivizing investments normally uh, every year. Um, do you think that this is currently the case, noting that the nat national infrastructure regime uh, has now been up and running for, for uh, more than a decade, um, 13 years now? Um, so, and and is, that, is that an issue that comes up um, uh, within your membership? So I think that, that's sort of almost a, a pet hobby horse of mine, actually. Um, because I think one of the things, so I, I suppose in, in, in actual fact, the answer is, is, is it doesn't help. Um, and I think the sort of one of my, my problems is that um, planning at the moment and how projects get sent forward, etc., cetera, um, can't be done in a silo. And I think too often government, unfortunately, does tend to operate. It tries not to, but does operate in silos. And I think as we look at the planning that's needed to, to deliver net, net zero, whether you're talking about our building stock, whether it's offices, warehouses, factories, or, or our, our homes, or whether you're talking about putting in charging infrastructure, or the recent example of the substation for um, one of the offshore wind farms um, in East Anglia, we need to have joined up cross-government approaches to this. Now, we're starting to hear positive signs that there are uh, ministerial groups around net zero, et cetera but we need to make sure that that trickles down to all of the various um, elements of, of government. So I think as far as planning is concerned, there's more work to do with, with, and it's going to, challenges are going to keep coming up over the next few years that I think government needs to, to get ahead of the game here. Thanks Lawrence, and, and, and a, a, a related question really, um, the question is, we act, when we act for developers, private developers, investors only tend to want to invest once the project has panel permission, development consent. What would encourage them to invest earlier so that these projects can, can get off the ground? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, when you look at sort of there, there are different, different types of fund have different types of risk appetite. Um, and so that, that will sort of, that in itself influences the kind of project that you're willing to, to undertake. And for a long time, I think uh, infrastructure investors have been looking at brownfields, so existing projects as, as the favoured option in terms of, of investment. But I think we're, we're starting to see with certainly slightly more mature technologies an appetite for investing in, in greenfield in, in new projects. I think that the key element will be understanding and seeing transparency in that development process, in seeing that government has a clear interest in getting these projects off the ground, in, in delivering them, and making sure that that happens in the fastest, most effective time possible. And I think in actually in, in the recent discussions and, and debates around the, um, the network costs and, and settlements from Ofgem, it, it's the speed that this is happening and, and the, the companies want to get projects underway, but they're not seeing the regulatory framework support the investment that, that is needed. And I think it's that kind of discussion that needs to be sped up. And if you can see these processes speeded up, then that, that brings confidence. And I think that that's sort of reflected in the comments I made around the National Security and Investment Bill, that if you can see it, a transparent decision-making process, you understand how that operates. And you can see that it's not going to be, you're not going to be bogged down in months of, excuse me, by an next comment, legal negotiations and fees, then that's going to encourage you to invest. And on the um, National Security Bill, is, is, I mean, that's probably taken up a fair amount of time um, within the uh, association. Is, is, that, is there still sort of fear and, and uh, uncertainty about, exa about exactly what it will, will involve and require? Um, I think fear is, is, is perhaps too strong a word. Um, I mean, we, we've had, I think, very, very constructive conversations uh, with, with the team. Uh, in government, which which have been encouraging, uh, um, we've had. But some of the members have had initial um, involvement in terms of project discussions, and I think it's it's fair to say that response from government so far has been positive. In when problems have been identified, they've been swift to try and understand what those are and how they can how they can run things better in the future. So, I think you know again, it, it, there's a level of, of of cautious um optimism around that but it will be critical to make sure that it does work efficiently and smoothly if you're going to get that confidence of, of investors back and that word confidence is just so important when we're looking at global markets and we uh, we know that the 27 countries of the european union are also looking at mass levels of investment. We know regardless of the two trillion program that Biden is introducing, the US is looking at massive levels of investment. Look at the offshore wind farm that they've just effectively given the go-ahead to of Martha's Vineyard and so on and so on. So if we want to win our share of that money, we've got to make sure investors have the confidence in the UK structures. Thanks, Lawrence. So now moving on to different sectors of rail. Um, is there a view towards the recently announced uh, rail project speed. Uh, is the association involved in this review and what are your thoughts on speeding up the process? So I can in all honesty say that we haven't <laughs> got involved in that one um, so it would probably be improper of me to comment. Okay. Um, on a, a, maybe a more novel, a more novel technology, uh, energy and hydrogen, which is obviously mentioned in one of your, one of your points um we're still awaiting the hydrogen strategy at some point uh in q1 um do you, do you think the government's doing enough to to facilitate facilitate the investment and allow investors to understand exactly what the government is proposing and the time frame for for, for hydrogen projects to come forward so I, I think this is a sort of yeah another problematical one actually where if one were to issue a report card um you certainly wouldn't be in the A's and B's, you'd be lower down. I mean, I think in terms of, you can see that there's a there's a vision. And again, you can reflect on the CCC's advice and you can reflect on, on comments coming out from, from Bayes and number 10 for that matter, that hydrogen has a role in our economy going forward. 
Um, but I think there are, there are still big, big questions as to what that role will be. And there's a, a really fevered debate, for example, between the role of um, electrification in terms of um, heating and the role of potentially hydrogen in the future in heating. And are we going to be running our gas boilers in hydrogen on the future or are we going to be getting uh, heat pumps? You know, they, those questions alone uh, relate to tens of billions of investment and it's investment that needs to be happening now and you throw in how we're going to be operating heavy transport that I mentioned earlier you know does that make sense to to have hydrogen as a solution there as opposed to electrification how are you going to operate how are you going to produce hydrogen you know we know that we can use uh, excess renewable energy to create hydrogen but we also know that the costs for doing so are quite high at the moment so actually we've we've got a sort of you know we're trying to move to green hydrogen but actually we're sort of we're not there yet because a lot of the hydrogen has quite a high carbon content in terms of its production at the moment but having said that five years ago ten years ago the cost of offshore wind was sky high you know compared to uh, the more recent settlements we've gone from 150 to uh, megawatt hour to um, what around 50 40 so I'm certainly not going to say that the costs of creating and, and producing hydrogen are not going to fall I really think they will fall along with costs of batteries and, and such like but yes we really need government to, to say okay let's take a risk let's get some projects up and running let's use back to the bank some of the funding from the bank to get some projects up and running i mean i was i was reflecting the other day that um carbon capture use and storage ccus which is often seen as a, a critical element of, of hydrogen i first spoke about ccus in, in westminster at the, the methodist hall just over the road from from bays back in 2000 and we still haven't got any demonstration projects, let alone an actual business up and running in the UK. We've had two competitions that the government has pulled out from at the last minute. The last one costing you know, millions of pounds for the companies that were that were in the sort of final round of the competition. So we've got to sort of just get the bit between our teeth and get on with some of these projects. Yeah, completely agree. And um, you know, we've done done well at the vaccine rollout. Uh, relative to our, Euro 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 relative to our European friends, so I think there's a bit of catching up to do on uh, on hydrogen and um, and uh, carbon capture. Um, uh, question on EV: um, Government has set a hard deadline for ending the sale of petrol diesel vehicles, but the infrastructure needed for for EVs is simply not in place yet. How can we ensure that the government sorts this problem? Is it a case of putting local government in charge, or can local government uh, can local government work with the private sector more closely? I think uh, um, absolutely local government can work with the private sector more closely. I think there are, there are great opportunities here. Um, I think the government does need to get more involved though. Um, I think it's got to set very clear um, guidance for local authorities. I think there's also, we need to really understand the difference between how Actually, let me rewind a bit here, because I think um, we need to understand the behavioural change that's needed from a consumer and how many of us will, uh, will actually take to driving an EV. And the quickest example I can give you of that is I never leave my house at the moment with a full tank of petrol. But because I have a driveway, I will often leave the house, well, I will always leave the house with a full battery. And for 90, 95% of my journeys, I will never need to use a fast charger because most of my journeys are under 100 miles or under 200 miles. And a tremendous number of the vehicles you can buy today can cover that. So we need to understand who requires fast chargers on the motorway network. We, under, we also need to understand though, and one of the companies I, I have an association with Connected Curve is in this sector. We need to understand um, that many many millions of households don't have drives and so we'll be looking at the the public charging infrastructure so how we can actually if you like electrify our streets to make sure that if i am parking two streets away from my house i can still charge my car or that i've got charging available at my place of work and i think government can actually do a lot by taking a lead here and saying actually why not off the back of covid why not say we're going to electrify 
NHS parking. Uh, we're going to electrify MOD parking. We're going to do this. So why don't we actually start rolling out charge points within our own estate so that we can set the example and we can help people who are working for government and give a direct benefit back. So I think to come back to the question, yes, investors, I think there's a great role for working with local authorities and county councils in terms of the provision there. I think there's a huge role for making sure that we do have that national fast charging network. And then I think government has a role to play in making sure that the setup within its house is in order, but also potentially to sort of look at how we manage this whole process across the country. And what one quick final point, uh, which we were speaking to the Scottish government about the other day, we've got to make sure we don't leave rural communities behind. And there's a really important part in terms of private usage of charge networks, but there's also a massive point here in terms of how we make sure that we can provide zero carbon public transport solutions to some communities as well. So massive, massive agenda, but a really exciting one. And also linking the, the previous two questions, is there, um, you know, we talk about EV, also hydrogen vehicles, is there, does that create any investor uncertainty about, you know, which to back or, or are investors happy that both, both horses are backable? I think that the sort of the, the feedback that we pick up generally is uh, certainly from a from sort of as I mentioned earlier that the business to business area, I think there's there's no problem in terms of you can see revenue models and you can see how things are happening. So I think there's there's no worries investor wise there. I think as as our PwC report um, highlighted that the sort of yeah you know, some people and it was a wonderful phrase feel that sort of in terms of EV charging it's a little bit like the wild west out there and we need to get over that so we can build consumer confidence up around um, how EV charging and battery charging is, is really going to function. But I haven't seen the sort of the concern around from a consumer or, or sort of light van perspective around this fight between um, battery and, and hydrogen. I think where the hydrogen bit fits in is industrial processes, can it be used for, for heating? And can it be used for train transport or for um, uh, heavy HGVs, that kind of thing? So I think it's a slightly separate debate as things stand at the moment. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, okay, another question. Um, so gov governments, shall go, but I think this is previously um, a, set, a question that was delivered before the session started. Um, okay. So uh, this comes from a promoter of a certain uh, rail link, um, uh, which is widely supported, requires no public money, but faces two challenges. Uh, government sees any form of usage undertaking, uh, guaranteeing the quantum of trains, but without taking any capex, opex or revenue risk as requiring classification in the public accounts. And the government questions the basis for private finance when public monies are available at a perceived lower cost albeit taking no account of cost and program risk. Uh, so would you be able to comment on whether other infrastructure projects face similar challenges? And if so, uh, is there a solution? Yeah, I saw, I saw that question. I thought it was really interesting because I mean, in, in short, no, we're not. And I think in, in everything that we've seen from the government uh, since, yeah, for the last few years, actually, um, yeah, we've seen this, this point coming through. And I think it's just got, the, it's just the message has got louder over the last uh, few years that they need public money, uh, private money, and they expect private capital to come in into the markets. So there is this expectation that yes, government is, is obviously going to spend many billions on on infrastructure, but they are expecting the private sector to invest tens and tens and hundreds of billions in infrastructure. I think where some of the problems might lie here and and we've we've challenged government on this is we need clarity around where government sees its pound being spent in infrastructure and where it has this expectation that the private sector is going to come in and support that and i don't think they've been as clear as they perhaps could be in what those dividing lines are um, and so I think that that's probably a conversation there, but no one said to us in, a, in an open meeting, we don't want private capital. They have only said we fully expect and need private capital. Um, and I don't see that changing. Okay, now sort of a, a 
question about um, the sort of wider uh, impact of decarbonisation. Um, so should we uh, not be considering the use of minerals and mining in the use of batteries for EVs? So obviously they use um, uh, certain rare earth metals, etc. cetera. Uh, and there's an enormous mining uh, effect. So is there a consideration of that, that wider uh, impact for, for investors? And another similar related question, alongside enabling decarbonisation, does infrastructure investment community have the appetite and information needed to invest to improve resilience to the change of climate and also enable nature recovery? Yeah, I mean, two, two fascinating questions that we could, we could probably do one of these on alone, actually. Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of the first one, and, and we referred to it with the, the nuclear question earlier, um, I think with a lot of these areas, you can, you can see a very clear investment case, but I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, for a long time uh, of ESG, it was the G that always had the, the sort of the headlines. It was making sure that your governance is in place. I think that, that that's still the case, but we're seeing much, much, much more concentration now from funds on the environment, the E and the social, the S of ESG. And I think that that is so important because funds have a massive part to play in influencing the supply chain and making sure that when we're building new infrastructure, we can be confident in, in the supply chain and that the environmental issues are being dealt with at each step along the line. And you know, you know as well as I do that we're also seeing much more, much, much more shareholder activism in this regard. And I think if you're not taking ESG seriously or, or the UN SDGs, then you're, you risk becoming, becoming a cropper in terms of your shareholders biting back at you. So it's, it's absolutely critical that we do that. And I think as far as the sort of it managing climate risks um, by pure coincidence of that question. Um, I did a, a paper yesterday on exactly that and making sure that um, we understand as infrastructure asset owners and operators, the climate risks that we're, we're facing, both in terms of rising sea levels in weather changes, et cetera, but also that we understand the adaptation bill um, that we will have to be doing. And we spoke at the um, UN uh, Climate Adaptation Conference um, a month ago, and that was a very, very important theme. And of course, the further out you look in terms of climate change, the less certainty we have around the impact. So it's really incumbent on us as, as infrastructure owners that we have models in place, that we understand this, and we can act on it. And if anyone wants to know more information about that, please do pop onto our, our website where we have free, free series of reports that we did with uh, Marshall McClellan that can look at that in, uh, in much more detail. That's really helpful. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, this is quite an interesting question where you may be able to feed in. We are an SME. Uh, we're looking at major infrastructure projects. Does the association have a publicly available list of funds uh, with information on sectors they're interested in, geographies, whether equity debt, uh, what part, part of the project they're interested in, seed funding, development funding, et cetera, et cetera? Um, Is there a... That's a, a great question, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe it's something that we should have. <laughs> um, so let, let me take that one away. Unfortunately, we don't at the moment, but uh, yeah, you've got me thinking now. <laughs> A um, uh, question on rail, with regards to the future of rail, what do you think the key themes that need to be looked at are? Um, so you mentioned electrification. Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think there's, there's obviously the whole issue of, um, of, of net zero. So electrification, I think, has, has got to be writ large on that. Um, and I think there's also the sort of, the issue of, of understanding how we're going to be moving around the country and, and the connectivity of our infrastructure and making sure that, that that's all in place. And as I say, I'm not, I'm not a rail expert, but I think yeah, government needs to make sure that when it's talking about these projects, one, we understand what the public purse is funding, two, we understand what the opportunities or what the requirements for private financing will be, and that we have a long-term plan around how we're going to develop our transportation infrastructure over the next decades and how we can do so in, in the manner that is as low carbon as, as absolutely possible. 
Thanks, Lawrence. Um, okay, another another question on, on the planning process. Um, I mean, at the start, you mentioned public attitudes to, to infrastructure, um, and we're lagging behind in the UK, and that probably feeds into the into the planning system as well. The sort of NIMBY NIMBY attitude uh, in some in some sectors. Um, the question is, uh, you, you mentioned getting on with these projects. Um, some of the recent offshore wind farm promotions emphasise the challenges of taking projects through the DCO uh, process as, as uh, nationally significant infrastructure projects. Um, do you think there's a need for an, uh, significant planning reform in order to drive the net zero agenda? I think that probably, you know, within that, I think we can probably talk about the involvement of, of, of the public uh, in terms of consultation requirements in that process as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the sort of short answer there, Richard, is is yes. Um, and But is it a sort of classic yes, but? Um, you, you don't want to have um, the, the general public feeling that these decisions are being forced upon them and that they don't have a say. I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that, that we've really got to be talking about the, the value of what we're doing and get the general public buying in to why we're doing it and i think um you know, unfortunately perhaps understandably you know, those of us arguably in the westminster bubble we see what's happening we understand what's happening you, we all need to step outside of that bubble from time to time and see and hear what's what people are talking about in local communities and you know but only by doing that i think can you start seeing the scale of the issue that we have to face and you know just yeah, minor examples of why don't people get their, their lofts insulated because it's too much hassle to go up and, and empty the loft and I've got nowhere to put it and where do I put it back? And B&Q a few years ago offered to empty the loft, insulate it, store everything in the loft and then put it back and people still didn't want to do it. So yeah, we, we've got this behavioural change that we need to work on and, and that again is an area that I think we all have a part to play on as, as either influencers ourselves or actually working with government and other stakeholders to look at how we move these discussions around planning forward in a way that local communities have confidence that they're confidence that they're going to be heard and investors and developers have confidence that they can see the timelines very clearly and the transparency of any uh, decisions that are made i mean personally I, I i do think we i think promoters can do more to um to, to work with communities to, to, to explain technologies. I've always found it amazing that uh, energy from waste plants in, on the continent um, can zoom through the, the, the process with little or no objection, whereas over here, it could be thousands of uh, objections on, on a EFW scheme. Yeah, EDF down in, in Hinckley, uh, you know, did a, a fantastic, have done and continue to do a great job, I think, in engaging the local community, not just in terms of what's happening, but engaging local businesses. And a lot of those businesses are, are now really you know, performing superbly off the back of Hinkley and, and the business that's being awarded locally. So there's, there's lots of different things we can do and, and actually lots of projects we can, we can learn from and we should do. Okay, right, I've been told my internet connection's unstable, but I'll, I'll, I'll power on. It's now 10 o'clock, but I think we can probably squeeze in one final question. Um, how much less attra attractive is investment in roads than in other sectors, given the real difficulty of putting a clear revenue stream in place? Yeah, and, and I think, um, yeah, that, that's one of the issues that I, I sort of, I would tend to, to put in the, this camp of um, where's public money being spent and where's private money being spent. And I think roads are perhaps one of those areas that, that in this country, do perhaps fit more into into the, the the public purse as opposed to the private purse because I think there are many other projects um, that uh, that that require funding that that fit the, the private infrastructure uh, elements and I think unlike the states where there's a tremendous number in each state of of toll roads for example many of which are privately owned and operated we don't have the same situation in the UK but there are of course elements of our road network that could be very attractive to uh, investors. If we're going to have uh, road pricing, we're going to need all of the infrastructure uh, 
um, around that to be set up, invested in, run, etc. So, you know, opportunities there, opportunities as we mentioned earlier in fast charging, but in in particular road building, and this may be just a personal view. I think it's probably more for the public purse. Thank you, Lawrence. So it's now uh, one minute past ten. Um, plenty of compliments in the um, in the chat function. So. Um, I'd just like to wrap up now and say a big thank you to um, to Lawrence and John. Um, it's been a fascinating uh, webinar. Um, and in the coming days, hopefully um, at some point this week, we'll be sharing a recording um, uh, via email. Uh, and it will also be uploaded to YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it again um, over these to holidays. There's nothing else to do. Um, and finally, from me, thanks to everyone um, who attended. A really good attendance once again. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming you to uh, future B2B events, whether business breakfasts uh, or otherwise, and hopefully uh, in the flesh at our still shiny new office um, in uh, near St. Paul's. So um, thanks very much and have a great day.